Good evening, everyone. I am Michael Gibson. It's a pleasure to be back with you tonight. Uh, Thursday evening is all, always one of my best nights of the week, uh, only because, of course, uh, Friday's coming, and that's always a good day. And Thursday denotes a sense of, okay, we got through the week. All we have to do is kind of get everything ready for next week tomorrow. It's always a good feeling to do that, even if you had a bad week. Sometimes you have to chalk up those bad weeks as the weeks that you learn from, that you try to superimpose over your good weeks in the future to ensure that you filter out what could possibly go wrong. I think that's what yin and yang and frickin' frack and up and down is all about. It's about being on one place and on one plane of existence where things are going well, and then being on another plane where it's not going so well or your way. And you have to learn how to take both of those opportunities and learn from them. I think that's the whole idea of non therapy. We actually, instead of counseling in traditional sense of counseling, we not only talk through, but we try to teach our victims and survivors of abuse, whether it's self-abuse, narcissistic abuse, bullying, cyberbullying, financial abuse, or any other sexual abuse or child abuse, any of, or any of the other abuses that we champion, we want people to look for a way to work themselves out of it through our techniques and our years of training and development and through the excellent online training school that we've established, Norm Therapy. And uh, and we churn out some pretty fantastic uh, individuals. We have had medical doctors, psychotherapists, attorneys, uh, geneticists, uh, entrepreneurs, everyday people uh, as well, some educated and some not, who've gone through our course from around the world and have consistently made it clear that what we do changed lives to include theirs. So that's always an accolade or a pat on the back that we're looking forward to. Today, we have our good friend Montes with us. This is one of the guys that I actually like. A lot of times you get into sessions, I have another couple of guys that I work with in sessions who are amazing human beings. Montes touches my heart because he sees his problems in life and he tackles them head on. He's got a good attitude about it. Although he fails sometimes, like we all do, he's always ready to pick himself back up and make, you know, lemonades out of lemon, a lemonade out of lemons. I put the plurality on, an, on the wrong word. But that's how he gets me tongue twisted to talk to him because I enjoy it. So without any further ado, I'll ask Montes to come in. Good day, my friend. How are you? Hello. Good day. How you doing? I'm good. I'm doing very well. I like to lead up our conversation about norm therapy and what we do at normtherapy.com. But more importantly, our nonprofit is the entity that we use in order to we undergird norm, norm therapy undergirds arrow. So we provide them the expertise, the training, the curriculum, the everything they need in order to be able to provide our services to the public. And that's how we met you and Bobby, of course. And uh, so I always want to pay homage uh, to uh, Arrow uh, from Norm Therapy. And one is a for-profit company, Norm Therapy. We do not commingle anything <laughs> at all, but we share in the joy and the benefits of having the service that we do. And we do not charge Norm, I mean, Arrow anything for that service. Blah, 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 five more thousand words. How are you today, Montes? I ain't, I ain't doing too good today. Sometimes that happens. Tell me about it. What's happening with you? Well, um, I, I got up this morning, went through my routine, went to work, went to the meetings, left one meeting, went to another meeting. Um, we have a group meeting with the clinicians, counselors, case managers, nurses, nurse practitioners, and then we have just the case managers meetings, only five of us. Mm -hmm. um, they were, there was a talk about uh, 
a, a few people who were still getting services and employed there were still getting services. So there was an ethical talk. And then they talked about people who were people who had a background had to be two years past parole or probation. I got 14 left. And so when they went around the table and they asked, I told them, they said, well, it's not, it's not base camp. You have a job. It's just that the problem is with Medicaid, you have to be clear with them to be able to get a billing number to bill your clients. Nobody said none of this stuff at the interview. I wouldn't even waste my time. I was already in swing. I was swinging already. And uh, I ain't never, I, I never got an opportunity like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I lay out here and I and I put I put my soul on the on the, on the in in harm's way and then I get my mind ready for what it, what needs to be done and I learn the tricks of the trade and yeah I, I feel like you're playing with me now. Um, I got a family, I have a house, I have I have I have responsibility like everybody else. You can't just you just can't you can't just wipe me down because of a broken system that decided to give me for the rest of my life on parole. Something that happened 20 years ago. When I was 20, 25, 20. Let me ask you a question before we go into that. Why did you get such a long parole? Is that normal? Because I've never heard anyone said I have 15 years of parole. I've heard two years. Or, you know, I got this three years, but never 15 or 20 years. I've never heard that. Well, Maybe see, I don't know enough people coming out of prison. Who, I don't know. But you don't know enough people. You don't know enough people coming out of prison out of Wisconsin. See, Wisconsin has the worst prison system in the country. They have more prisons than they do factories, and that's out. That's going over California or Texas or any of other bigger states. Wisconsin has what you call truth in sentencing, meaning they want all of their time. They will give you an end time and an out time. I got twenty three years for my crime. I was to do eight in, which I ended up doing almost 10 and a half. I ended up doing 10, um, getting in trouble, jailhouse cases and stuff. But I was to do eight in, 15 out, a total of 23 years. Wow. And 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 that's what that's how the end. It was my first case. I was I, I was on an interstate compact from Chicago. I got out of prison in Illinois first and went straight to Wisconsin. I hadn't seen my mom 27, 28 years. So I went to Wisconsin, and uh, it took me 40 days to get stuck. And I couldn't leave with not knowing anybody. I didn't know my mom, you know what I'm saying? So coming from a little bitty tiny town that didn't even have a bus system, now I'm in a bigger city with nobody and got to find, gotta learn, got to find my way somehow. Oh, yeah. um, so what happened today? Were you removed from the program? Well, they didn't. They didn't remove me, but they couldn't have me work without an, an answer for Medicaid uh, health insurance. Mm -hmm. So much. Yeah. Before we go there, I want to get back to that. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm, my brain is spinning. And I'm. is there a way you can vacate that parole and petition to not have to fulfill the parole to its fullest extent? Yeah, I got to I got to have two years in compliance. And you've only had fourteen months. You're saying? No, I've 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 been I've been free. I mean, completely free. I had to go back for fifty days, but that's fifty days. I for the for the most part of eight that's years, enough. I've been free. Yeah, that was just a violation. I didn't okay. commit a crime. I didn't follow a rule. You know what I'm saying? So, so how long do you have on a, on a good? You got five years now, right? No, I got fourteen years left. From see that's the, the yeah. Wow. See that that's the trick. See when in Wisconsin, if I get out of prison with fifteen years to do, and I stay out for ten years, and then I get a violation, I go back. I don't care if they gave me twenty three years, and I got to do fifteen years on parole. As soon as I get get a violation, and they give me a sanction, they'll give me a ninety day sanction, sitting in a county jail but they'll take all of the good time that you got on the street and start you over. It's called double jeopardy. 
No, uh, you being penalized twice. One you have been adjudicated on. I, be I believe it works like one you've been adjudicated on, and that's the the prison sentence that you have. But the other one is a uh, a code violation or a policy violation that's mm -hmm. not under the judicial system, so they can't consider it double jeopardy. In order for they it to, they, no, in order they for probably it to can't jeopardy. consider it double jeopardy but they can't give me more time than what the judge gave me. If you take five years from me, you're hey, you're making me do 28 years, not 23. You're giving me more time than There's I was saying. with the math. I yeah. absolutely agree. But I think they have it baked in this way for a reason. I think you told us the reason not too long ago. You actually said, our, one of our sessions, a couple of sessions ago, you said that it's a business. And that's why they go with the whole time. I'm not sure what... Wisconsin produces other than farmland and I'm not sure what the main uh, crop there is or the main uh, commodity coming dairy. out. Dairy, exactly. Wisconsin dairy. You're absolutely correct. And, you know, I, that can't be uh, supplementing the entire state's coffer in order yes. to generate uh, what it needs so prisons, since it has more prisons, you said, than factories, are probably a more profitable business for the state. And to keep you guys in prison, once you go in prison, even when you're out, you're in prison because you're on that long parole. I think that's probably a good thing for you initially because you can get out early and spend the rest of your time on parole. But in the long term, it prohibits you from being involved with anything relevant on the outside in order to benefit and bring your life along. So you're caught right back in to catch 22, no matter how much good time you do, had it been for that violation, you would have been okay. I think, I hope. Uh, well, sometimes, sometimes the violations, man, don't you, do you know that I, I have a rule that says that I can't get, I can't lease a car or I can't have a bank account. We're talking about rules like that that they can violate me on to send me back to prison for. Simple rules like that. So the law in the United States is exactly that. If you deposit three thousand dollars in cash or two thousand or something in cash, then they must report it to the government. But you're saying that um, for the if you take cash, let's say you make three thousand dollars in a month, you can't have a bank account. But you go into, let's say, your wife's account and you deposit your $3,000 in cash after cashing it at the currency exchange or whatever place that you could cash it. And then you put it into uh, her bank account and you have to fill out a form saying you're putting money into the account. Is that a violation to deposit money into accounts if you are prohibited of having an account in a banking institution? You didn't rob a bank, did you? No. So and this is all convicts. Did all anybody, if well, according to the states that I've been in prison in, that's Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. All of those states had rules to that effect. Two of them had that specifically and verbatim. You cannot have account in your name. If I'm I deposit, I've, no, no, no. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna definitely read up on this because this is fascinating to me. So, yeah. very tools you need to operate. As a citizen, <laughs> as a human being, reinstating yourself to the human condition of life and place and people and opportunities, you're prohibited by law and violation of your parole to have a bank account or lease a car, a method of conveyance that everyone should have the right to, but you can't have it because you are ex-convicted. So or on probation. So you cannot do or participate those in those things in life that could catapult you forward or prevent you from going back in or creating uh, or stopping you from creating a circumstance where you're not stressed and desperate for opportunities, but you can't do this and you can't do that. And you can't do this. None of the things you need to have in order to make a life for yourself. You're saying, that that does not exist by law. Sounds like modern day slavery to me. Hmm. 
<laughs> That's what it sounds like. Whether you're yeah. white or black or Hispanic or any culture, you go into the prison system in some states or most states, and you're prohibited to use the tools to get your life back together, is what you're saying to me, correct? Yeah. You know I'm going to look this up. And I this pisses me off. This, this upsets me. I can do you, know? you one better. I can get right. a copy of my rules. I can get a copy of my rules or forward them to you and let you see. I'd love to see them. I would make sure you do that. I, I don't want to exactly your personal right. business out on the internet, but we can discuss it in our next session. Yeah. I think that's a travesty of justice and, and fairness. Uh, you went to pay your dues to society in prison and continually paying your dues on probation by, you know, walking the straight and narrow and being innocent of all things except for those violations you need to never do again because they are petty and small oh. and uh -huh. you know, some, sometimes unjust. But I think they're built into the system this way. And that's a shame. That's a shame. It's like, it's like when you get a divorce. If you don't pay child support, you know what they do? They don't Locked just... Yeah, they, they put you in prison. So how do you take care of your children? They take your driver's license away. How do you work to take care of your children to stay out of prison? It's a business. It's a shame, but it is. It doesn't matter. You. It, this has nothing to do with race. It has to do with, forgive me, but in every country I've been in life, it has to do with slavery. Um, this is just legal slavery. It's a tr it's, it's terrible. Uh, now, the crimes that are committed by a great percentage of the people in prison are unforgivable on any level, are un unforgivable. And maybe this castigation or this punishment is something that is deserving to some, but I don't think it should be blanket across the board. Yeah. I, I don't think it should be blanket across the board. I cannot see a reason in my mind's eye, and I think I'm a very logical person, why a human being who's seeking work and opportunity and a, and, and a chance to have a, a better start and do better and not be a criminal and not do the things that they used to do that got them in prison in the first place. It seemed like a shame that that person is prohibited to own things or have access to things that only people who work should have a car, get to work, get home. Well, you, if you're in a metro system where there's a good metro, you should be able to have a car at one metro station, get on the train, go to work, come back to that train stop, pick up your car and go home. Because it's a business. It's a terrible business. It's a terrible business model. And I think we've churned out more criminals out of prison than rehabilitated people like yourself, I consider you rehabilitated because you are act you're taking active measures in your own life to do something with your life and to not go back, even though you've easily, it's easy to fail what they've given you. It's simple. You know, you got to get to work. How do you get to work? I got to take a bus. I got to wait an extra hour. I got to be outside in the cold. I got to do this. If Bobby can't take me. I can't this. You know, I can't have a driver. You know, those kinds of things um, will produce a criminal. Yeah. You're being strangled in every direction you go, but you're not being availed the opportunity to do the right thing because you don't have the equipment, the tools, the access or anything. That's what it sounds like to me. Now, I don't know this for a fact. I'm looking at you and I believe you and I take your word, but I'm definitely going to read up on it. Because this is an interesting conversation. And it's a shame that our politicians, you know, I heard someone say something a long time ago. They said the object of electing people to office isn't about putting a good man in office or a good woman in office. Politics have never been about putting the right man in, in the White House or the Senate because it's a business. They go in and they vote their own interests. They vote what's important to them and their constituents who are paying them money. It's a business. Being a politician, a senator, a state representative, a president, it's all about business and your constituencies. 
what it's about. So the object isn't trying to put the right guy in the right place to do the right thing. The object is to make it financially profitable and productive for the wrong person to do the right thing. It's kind of backwards and stupid, but it works to such the degree that people will put the worst human being in power. Yet, they're comfortable with it because their interests in financial and otherwise are being met. So they get the worst person to do the right thing or they get the best person to do the wrong thing against their opponents or their opposition. Prison systems seem to have that kind of skullduggery and trickery baked into it. Mm -hmm. That's a shame. That's a damn shame. Abusing yourself or being abused is easy. You're such a vulnerable target. I'm not making this victimhood for you. I'm not making it you an eternal victim or a sorry case. That's not what I'm saying at all. But the deck is definitely stacked against people like you because not everybody go in for 23 years. Some people go in for two years and come out for six months of probation or a year of probation. The crimes you committed caused that to be the case in the state where you were adjudicated and tried. Yeah. But there has to be a better way. That's all I'm trying to say. Now, we spent a lot of time on that. And I, I want to talk to you about something else, but will they be allowing you, after hearing from Medicaid, if Medicaid says everything is okay, will they be allowing you to continue in your uh, occupation? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah then that's see. not a bad day, bro. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Even though you felt down and it was, they would, felt like they were playing with you and, and why, why even have me come along this way to or hit this robot. A bad day is when they say no and there's no way around it. That's a bad day. Your day is we got to finish what we're doing. Let's see it through. Let, the probability is probably good. That's probably why they're keeping you on, that they're going to approve you. And, it, you know, I, I I heard once a guy says to one, uh, one guy say to another, he says, um, you don't seem to be worried. You could be killed tonight, but you don't seem to be worried at all. And a guy he looked at him, looked at him straight in the face. He said, "Well, would it help if I was worried? Would it help?" And the guy looks back at me and said, "You know, it wouldn't. It would not help. So why worry? I would get my attitude back, my friend, and, and feel grateful that it's you and your machinations that are making this thing move forward, because you're that." entity that they wanted in there and they hired and they wanted to be a part of this. So it's about you now. I think that's a strong move made today. And against all odds and all aridity, you're still in the game. That's a good day. Unless I miss something, that's a good day. Worse than yesterday, but better than nothing at all. Yeah, I ain't confident I ain't make no money. I know. If if you had a magic wand and you can wave it today, what would you wave it to have? Just one time to wave it and have exactly what you want. What would that be? Well, I probably would set it to 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 where I didn't have to worry about my household. Worry, worry about a bill getting paid or worry about that side of life. But security. Security. <clears throat> hey. Well, let me say this to you. Security in life is one of the key principles you should never violate. And I'm glad that you chose security, even though I would have chose uh Something else. But I think yours is better for you and your family. First of all, you need a good plan. Back in the military, uh, four principles of, uh, I think it's an ambush, if I remember correctly. Four principles of an ambush is, uh, not an ambush, but uh, an attack, is a plan, a reconnaissance, control, and security. But if you have a good plan and you have 
a good reconnaissance or review and understanding of your plan and how it applies and how you can move it forward. If you have control over that plan and that review for the civilian people out there, we would say recon, recon in the military, but if you had security to go with it, they all work together. Your plan, your review and understanding of your plan, your control of it, as well as your security of it. All of those principles work together. Any violation of any one of those principles, your plan will fail. If you got a crappy plan, but you're in control of it with a good review and, uh, and security, it means nothing because you just have a, a crappy plan that won't work. If you have a poor understanding of your plan, it won't work. Any absence of any of the principles, if you're, if, you're, if you're not secure or if it's not a secure situation that you've set up for your plan, it will not work. If you have no control of it, it will not work. So all of these principles must always work together. Yeah. If you have a plan, a review, an understanding of what you're doing, you have control of it and you're secure in it, you will be in a much better place to succeed. And you can outwit the state or the prison system or any other system because when you violate principles is when you lose in life. That's when you lose. But if you maintain your principles, you will find a better path every time. So security is so important, brother. You just named one of the top four securities and four principles in life. Security is one of the top four principles in life no one should ever violate, no matter what they do. So with that, you know, every day we inch forward and we talk, we're getting closer, closer to funding the norm therapy side of the house. And you don't know what I'm going to say to you in a couple of weeks. You have no idea or so. You have no idea. I don't know what I'm going to say to you yet, yet, but I know I'm going to give you an opportunity. I like you. I think you're smart, cunning, you're slick. You're a lot of things, but I know you. And that's good. And I like you. And I think you would be an, I don't care if you got 80 years on probation. That I could care less about that. And because we don't care about Medicaid in our organization, you'll be getting full benefits if you came on board with us. I'm saying that in public on a taped interview right now, because that's how valuable you are. And people that you would bring to the table that are in similar circumstances and people that will recruit from the outside in similar circumstances to you, that's needed. What you know and how you can apply and help people in prisons across the country or world is so invaluable. It's not even funny. And no one's doing anything about it. And the people who are doing something about it, they're against insurmountable, up against insurmountable odds. You need to homogenize and level that playing field a little bit. But we'll talk more about that over time. But I want to get ourselves together on the for-profit side so we can continue our nonprofit services. It's really an amazing thing. Uh, with all that's going for you now and the potential of losing it, how are you? How are you feeling about it? Man, I'm. I've been in the funk all day, man, because I I, I really put my best foot forward. I'm really uh, I'm, I'm 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 really somebody now. Probably wasn't nobody before. I am now though because I'm acting like it. And uh, yeah, ta da, magic. Yeah, I'm acting. Yes, right. You're demonstrative in your efforts to be someone. But remember, you were always someone. You just want you, you, you just were not a desirable somebody. But now you are desirable and you're workable and people can do stuff with you and depend on you. And, and more importantly, you can do stuff and depend on yourself. Yeah, that's the trick. That's where most people lose perspective on everything is they can't see themselves productive. They can't see themselves useful. At Norm Therapy, we teach one thing, and I need to share this with you, and I think you've heard me say it before. We don't believe in what's good and bad for you. I hate it when people say, oh, it's so bad to me. It's so good for me. It's so, sometimes it, that's so crippling to people, and they don't even see it. What people should first see before they look for the emotion of good and bad, they should look for the emotion of, or not the emotion, but the status of useful and useless. What is useful in my life? What is useless in my life? And make their decisions around that rationale and not, oh, it feels good. Oh, he treats me now. Oh, she treats me well. Oh, she loves me. He... All of that is tertiary, even secondary or tertiary to what's primary. 
And what's primary is, is it useful? Is it yeah. productive? Does it make sense? And I think you're on that path, well on that path. To choose a life principle like security as the one thing you would wish for with a magic wand and not a million dollars or a hundred this or just security, that puts your priorities in well above most. And we need to get most people there where they're looking at their security, not just their physical security, but their mental security, their environmental security, and their job security, and their future security, and their family security. Those are the kind of securities that makes most sense. I, I'm applauding you for that one. That is one of those things that very few people will ever understand about. I mean, just they'll never understand it unless they live it. God, I love talking to you, but that's a half hour. <laughs> that's a half hour. That's a good half hour so far. Yeah. But I want to ask you something. You, you said something to me that I actually like, and I don't get a chance because I travel a lot and I do a lot of things. I don't get a chance to watch basketball anymore. I just don't. And you said your family's like, basketball heaven or something just like everybody hoops you got eight brothers or i mean it's like what do you got yeah no it's you got five brothers right uh -uh, i got eight brothers two sisters okay i knew it was a combination of eight and five okay you got eight yeah. brothers and two sisters that's a lot of people yeah and, and tell me in the family who else besides you play basketball my brother well, my brother Keith, he he's the god. He's the basketball god. My dad played ball. Um, I got two for four of my brothers and my big sister. And a couple and one or two honorable mentions. They're just basketball and they thing. One like the box. I took the basketball, I took the boxing. Um, wow. Wow. Well, <laughs> do you guys get together and play? Yeah, we play, but see, we can't. Okay, so <laughs> we that can't, we can't, we can't play without it being on the outside looking in. It, it'll, it'll look like we got a, we got a problem with each other. A big fight. Yeah. yeah, but we're not fighting. We're just playing. We're, Checking we're, hard. Oh yeah, we rough. <laughs> we're 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 we're, we're going to be rough. We're going to be nothing soft, even the girls, because they're going to be the ones started. <laughs> so, yeah, so so, so tough sisters too. Yeah, I got my my baby sister six feet, man. There you go. There you yeah, go. So, um, yeah, we, we it's gonna be it's gonna be some because we all we feel like we kings. Just like when I get on the chessboard, if you got to show me you gonna beat me. Can't just tell me if 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 you if you don't have a, a nice setup. If you don't know how to arrange them pawns. If you don't understand what a what a what a knight does or a bishop, don't get on that board with me. I'm going to beat you really quick. Well, that's you know that's that's clever. I mean, one yeah. of the things I love about Idris, which is called in some place in the world chess, one of the things I like about it is you have to be stealthy and cunning. <laughs> you just can't be smart and remember moves. Yeah, you have to go. You have to think so far ahead in steps mm -hmm. that you know that just by having the logic of that thought process forward, that yeah. you're going to end up in a good place along the path. And they may mm -hmm. end up in a good place as well because they're countering your moves as well if they're any good. That's what I like about chess. What I hate about chess is when you do all the good work and then you lose. <laughs> oh, yeah. It doesn't mean that every time you do good work, things are going to turn out for you. It just doesn't mean that. That's how life works. But I do love chess. And I love basketball. Man, do I love basketball. But I, I don't get a chance to participate as I used to as I was when I was younger. I, I just don't. But I love watching a good game and hanging out. I've had a few... Uh, athlete uh, basketball friends over the years uh, and uh, NBA guys. It was just, you know, it was a, a good experience. But one thing basketball teaches you, I think better than most sports, because everything is in real time happening right in the second, move after move, space after space, up and down the court. One thing I like about it, 
it shows you in real times and fluidly how teamwork yeah. is established and how yeah. it runs the best and who you can depend on in that clutch moment. <laughs> yeah. Who's going to be there in their spot where they need to be in order yeah. to take advantage of the opportunity. That's why I asked you about your family. Y'all play rough and y'all know how to check one another, know how to get it in the hoop, got the right height, got all that stuff going for you, and you got skills. Does anyone else in your state or in that state, do they admire your family for their basketball skills? What's going on with that? Do you have yeah. any kind of Mark, well, we, we, I mean, we are honorable mentions. I didn't, I didn't go to the NBA or nothing like that, but see, my brother Keith, we grew up, I was on junior varsity when Zach Randolph was on varsity. Wow. And okay. if you know, well, this is who we grew up playing ball with. The, at 13, he was tearing the rim down at our middle school wow. in game. And so, uh, but but Keith and Zach was like like this. And uh, it, yeah, he, like I said, he went overseas to play ball. He graduated from Kansas, um, Jayhawks. He lives in Kansas now. Mm -hmm. Um he, he was really he got all that he's going down in the books where I'm from. Um, yeah. everybody else, yeah, I'll be mentioned once or twice, but there were guards and stuff that was better than me. Mm -hmm. Um, my brother uh, was a small forward. He there were guards that were better than him, even though we might have been good for, for our time. These guys for all time. Got it. I understand. But, I mean, I, I'm using basketball not just as a sport or as a, a good teamwork exercise but also as a metaphor mm -hmm. i think that i think that what you need as the head of your family in your darkest hour even though i'm looking at you objectively yeah what you went through today could have been a hell of a lot worse and it does put things in jeopardy for a minute but not double jeopardy that's being tried for the same crime twice. Or you can be charged for the same crime twice, but you can't be tried for it. Um, but because they may be different crimes. But but I want to say that I think they made, they codified the prison system. They codified any kind of access to teamwork. Like everybody on your team right now can drive a car to work, right? Everybody in your your team can can opt in for uh, direct deposit to their checking account, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody in your team can get up and go on vacation and go somewhere else and just unwind and then come back to work and be ready to 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 do their best. Correct. Correct. Except for you, right? Yep. You see how this system is not just prisons that are this way, but most industries in the West are set up this way. You can have a union, but if you do, we're going to pay you less and we're going to negotiate our way out of helping you and giving you a living wage. But if you don't have one, we're going to work you to death and pay you more money. You know, there are a lot of disparities in society that needs to be looked at because it's no longer about the benefit of the people. It's about the benefit of the bottom line and it's profit centers, peripheral profit centers or direct or, or profit centers. It's about that. And that's something that needs to be checked as well. Um, someone asked, what kind of mindset or self care tools and your arsenal that you use in order to figure out if something is useful or useless to you in life. What do you do to figure it out? I can't tell you that I, I consciously sit here and, 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 and then weigh the pros and cons of it. I can only tell you that I I I think that uh, the last thirty years of my life, I've probably been one of those people who would I wouldn't be as shrewd as I needed to be when it was letting someone into my circle, and so I would let you in 
then prove yourself when it should have been prove yourself and I'll let you in. There you go. So I didn't, I've never, I've never sat back and thought about the process that I, you know, I, I, I take in order to decide whether or not I was going to deal with somebody. I just was always open. My, my arms was always open. I would accept you for exactly you who you were. useless situations into your life. Yeah. yeah. So now what do you do to prevent allowing those useless things into your life? To make, to only allow useful things in your life for now. What do you do to make sure that's the case? You know who Donald Goins is? I'm sorry? Do you know who Donald Goins is? Yeah, I know. Donald Goins? Goins, yeah. The author? Okay, the author. Goins. Yes, Goins, yes. Goins. Goins yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, um, I'm game tight. That means my guard up. That means I don't trust people no more. That means you can't you can't possibly be trying to get beside me. And I'm just I'm over here trying to live in my glory. You you can't be the one trying to do it. And if you are, it's either that you just like me or it's something to you. You see what I'm saying? You see exactly what you're saying. And that's that's a hard way to live, bro. It's tough. It's tough. I know. It's tough. Yeah, I know. And I'm not against what you're saying at all, because I've been there, too. I've been to the place where I don't trust a lot of people at all, and that, especially initially. But over the years, uh, I learned something else, a different philosophy about trust. And it works for me. I will only ever trust you until I have a reason not to. Mm. If you come in to me and I'm going to take you at your value, your face value, and I read people, I think you know. You read people. I'm sure I know that. Yeah, and I'm yeah. sure our audience gets that about us. So when we look at someone, we have an extra ability, that extra sensory eye up in here that sees things and hears things and listen to the trepidation in their voice, the fluctuation that we listen to the... We, we see the twitching of the eyes or the carotid arteries, or we see these things moving and it gives us rise quickly that that person may not be authentic. <laughs> you have yes. that skill, I, I know you do. And I'm not, I'm not trying to kiss your butt or placate you, that's the truth. Yeah. Use that, you'll have a more fulfilling life. I know it because this is what I do. I will only, I will trust you. Oh, so you jumped off the moon and parachuted 85 miles to the star and then you hit the earth. That's far-fetched and ridiculous that someone would say that. But I'm going to believe you. Not because I fell off a turnip truck, because I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt to correct yourself and to put yourself in a light where that becomes no longer a lie. And I'm going to trust you until I have a reason not to. And when you become surreptitious or vicious or bad or, or plotting against me or mine or those around me or yourself, that's when I had, can't trust you anymore because you're in violation of your own principle of the lie you first told. So sometimes it's okay to trust every single individual that comes across to you so long as you know better that what he's saying is BS, or she's saying is ridiculous, but you give them a benefit of the doubt to be themselves fully. How are you gonna know to what extent their BS goes, bro, if you don't let them talk? How are you gonna know? How are you gonna know how many hoops and turns they're gonna try and take you through if you don't just sit there and observe and be quiet, constantly losing that value of trust? So I think in order to have usefulness in people. They have to come to you on your level, not you on theirs. Sometimes you need to stoop a little and get to their level so they can get you. But that's not where you belong. You have to then stand back up. But you can never come to their level and remain on their level because of your coexistence with them, especially if your trust has been violated. So I'm saying all that it's an easier and healthier way to live. You don't have to do any guesswork. You just have to sit back and wait. Just wait. It'll happen. Anyone who knows me, 
I'm sure there's a couple of people watching right now who've known me over 30 years or so. And they know I have been consistently, consistently this exact same person all of those years. There's no game with me with that. If you like me, you like me, you're done, I don't care. I won't lose a wink of sleep. You are the same way. You just haven't had opportunities, the right circumstances to use your gifts and your skills. Most of my, what I'll call them patients, they don't have it. I have to actually teach them how to trust, teach them what a relationship looks like, teach them what love is and how separate it is from a relationship. It's not because they're stupid or dumb. It's just they've never known love. They've never known a good relationship. They've never known peace. They've never known a good woman. They've never known a good man. That's why. So we have to give them a benefit. And a strong guy like you and trusting somebody who needs to have your trust in order to even operate around you is a powerful tool. But you have to stop them every now and then like you do on the basketball court and check them and say, hey, I kind of know that that's not right what you said. And I like it very much that we not go back down that route again in that kind of conversation because it's pure hyperbole and lies. And you, you deserve more than that. Make it, put it on them. Brother, your trust, people will trust you beyond life because they know you're dead serious about it with them and you're not going to hold back. Because once you expose someone who's lying, putting up that facade, they have nothing behind which to hide anymore. They can no longer play that game with you. Call them out. Make it clear. And don't live your life not trusting them. Just live your life knowing what lies they can tell and what lies they can't. It makes it easy for you, bro. I tell people that who are sh only, only smart people know what I just said. And I don't mean just smart in books. I mean about life. Only real smart and clever people understand the value of trust and how to use it both ways. Hopefully over the time that we spend together, especially if we ever work together, I guarantee you that you'll see that I want everybody around me. And in our organizations, you'll see that there are three things that every single person, from the person who sweeps the floor all the way up to the executive director and myself, we have three things and everybody has the same thing. The first thing is you have autonomy. We give you autonomy to be you and to be the best person in the position you're in. And that's very important. Then on top of that, we give you the authority. Authority without autonomy is stupid. You got the authority to do this, but you can't go get it done because you don't have the autonomy to do it. <laughs> it's just stupid. So you have to give autonomy and authority together to your subordinates, to your leadership, to everybody. But most importantly, what you give everyone, which I think you live by, and I like this about you, is that you're responsible. Not only do we give everybody the responsibility, we give them the authority, and we give them the autonomy, all three. Because without any of those things, you're going to fail at whatever task you do. You will fail miserably unless there's such a rigid system where nobody trusts you in that system and you can't get anything done without their approval every step of the way. And that's micromanagement and that hardly ever works either. But authority, autonomy is so important, but the responsibility is the king. They must be responsible. Anyway, I got another question for you, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, have you told Bobby what happened today? Yeah, she knows. Okay. How did she take it? Was she supportive? Yeah, she she told me don't let it don't let it pull me down. That's that that's the first thing oh, she tell said. Me, brother, tell me what your wife said. She um, said, let it what? Yeah, don't don't let it pull me down. And then right. so uh I, I I got I got coals in the fire, sticks in the fire um already. I stay caught something and I got all the documentation that I need to bounce back as hard as tomorrow, as quick as tomorrow. Um, but she, she was, she was, she was there for me like she needed to be. So you yep. feel like you can really uh, get that kind of 
uh, support from your wife in these times? Do you feel that's going to become a consistent kind of uh, activity and attitude? She's always, anytime that I've worked, and, and, and I'm always doing something, even if I ain't signed a W-4, I'm outside watching the car, I'm doing something. But uh, she's and any time that I have in, in any form of work, she's always she's always you know tried to drive me and, and, and keep me motivated, encourage me and stuff like that. She she's she's always been good in that way. Um, you, she you look in the mirror when you see her. I, you know, maybe I said it backwards. When you look in the mirror at you, yeah, are you are you nowadays saying something like? How you like me now? I was. Oh, hold on a second. Why were you and why not? Why, why are you not now? Because of setback? I feel like it. I feel like I, I, I don't think I'm going to get a, a fair shake. And I, I feel like I got to hurry up and I got to bounce, you know, like a ping pong ball real fast. You know what I'm saying? Bills is coming in. Everything is, you know what I'm saying? So, before before the things that happened today, yeah, I, man, I know I'm finna come home and I ain't gonna have to do nothing. I know that 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 uh, I, you know, I, I I I had some success today. I progressed in some type of way. Um, I turned the dollar over somehow. I did something. I feel like a man today, and so hey, yeah, bro, you got you a man after my heart and soul. You know, you fall, but you you never stay down. You know, I I had a if I told you about my terrible week, bro, you'd be like, what? But I'm here with you. I'm here with you, and this is what I love doing, and I can't let my terrible week inter interfere with you, and us, and the things that I'm doing with the company forward and the visions we have in the future. I can't not I, those have to be two separate things that I deal with. You're doing that. It's hard when you've never had to do it before. It's hard delineating between what is necessary, unnecessary, what's useful and useless, and how to, you know, what are my backup plan? I think you just called it. I have to bounce on to something else. What, what do I do next if, in fact, this turns south? Contingency plans. That's hard work. That's hard. It's hard for people who who know what that means. It's impossible for people who don't know what it means. Most people can't say after a day you had where everything is up in the air waiting to see what happens. Most people cannot say, I got to bounce and do something else. I got to be ready for what happens next. Remember I told you a long time ago, you are very good at what happens next. Yeah. Whatever comes next, you're always good at it. You're always looking at what comes next if. That's not a bad thing to do. And that's not saying that you believe that your plan is going to fail. It's just that you have to be ready for what comes next. And I think that's very smart. I really do, Montes. Uh, should I say Montezuma? <laughs> 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 that name. So you are, you're of Indian descent and, um, and, and Black, of course, uh, African-American. And uh, you know why I like the term African-American? You want to know why I like it? Why? Wow. Because I really don't agree with it. Because I've been to Africa more times than most people have been in that backyard. And um, and the Africans are a whole different kind of brother. I mean, they, <laughs> they don't depend on white people. They don't depend on anybody but themselves. They don't have to look up. And they've never called anybody master, except for each other, because they enslaved each other as well. But the reason I like African-American is because when you call a person of color black, it's a sense of void. Black the definition of black is emptiness and void. It's terrible to be subjugated to that and relegated to that lower level of thought and existence. But what I like about African-American, it denotes a sense of economic parity. And like people don't say all oh, those green, uh, all those redheaded Irish, they say Irish Americans. They say Jewish Americans, Japanese Americans. Asian Americans, Indian Americans. Everybody has a culture and a race to go with their title, except for black people. Everybody, name a culture and a race. And they all spent times in a ghetto. I think ghetto is a German Jewish word. Italian. 
Okay, get ghetto, right? G H E T T O. You're right. So it comes from that whole old world. Mm-hmm. Black people didn't invent ghetto or hood. Just the neighbor was taken out of the word hood, neighborhood. That's all. But African American denotes a sense of economic parity, and it gives people an opportunity to see you eye to eye as a culture. And when people stop trying to think that someone else is appropriating or whatever the the new words and styles and and baggage that people are carrying with them these days, and they let all of that political correctness out of it. African-American is a good term. I don't even like it, but it is a very good term. And it's a good way to pair Black people with the rest of society. So when I look at Black people, especially like yourself, I think African-American because you're an American, but you have African descent, but you're also Indian American too. So that's a double whammy. Two very devastated people, uh, downtrodden people, uh, conquered people, uh, brutalized people, enslaved people, murdered people, stolen from people, land and Wealth and honor and respect and self. Everything. <laughs> but two of the strongest people. Two of the strongest people. Resilient. I heard someone say the other day that, and you know, I want to close you on this if I may, that no matter what you put in front of Black people, we've made it better from sports to school to education now. Golf. Golf? What? I'm just waiting on hockey. That's all I'm waiting on is hockey. <laughs> to see hockey go. You know, but, you know, Black people traditionally don't like cold weather, so I think they'll always have us on that one. But I'm not saying this in any kind of racist fashion. These are all facts. We have to stop looking at ourselves as less, as a culture. And we don't even have to think of ourselves as more. But we do have to start thinking of ourselves as enough. We are enough. And you have a beautiful, wonderful wife inside and out, amazing human being who's done things with her life that most women with a billion dollars couldn't even think of doing. You are an amazing brother that most millionaires out there who have everything at their beck and call and they can't do, they don't have the courage to walk down one path you walked. Not that it's a good path, but they don't have the courage to even go down that. Or the foresight or insight or the experience. You need to start thinking of yourself, brother, and I'm thinking you do, but more so that you are enough and that's it. And if this thing don't work out, something else will. And that's just how it operates. I'm going to close this out if that's okay. Yeah. Unless you have something to tell our audience. I always want to know what's on your heart before you go. And you've never told me one thing yet. So tell me something tonight. I'd like that very much. What's on your heart? I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to function. I'm not going to function correct if I don't feel like I'm doing something. In my mind, I'm not, I'm not and, and it's going to come out. Not, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make sure I, I, uh, I maintain not just my, my composure from right here first. Because when I get to thinking I don't want it, when I get the one to give up, that's exactly what I'm about to do. At least for the time being, I quit. And I don't want to quit. You believe in God, right? I believe in God. I love God. Okay. Well, remember what God said. Be still, my child. <laughs> Sometimes you have to stop and wait. Just be a little more patient. Don't ask God for patience because he'll give it to you. You'll wait the next 20 years for something to happen. <laughs> don't ask God. Just stop <laughs> And be patient and keep the best version of you and those things will occur. They have to. You have another choice. That's life evolving. That's all, bro. It's good talking to you tonight. I'm going to read this thing here because I think it's important. Not that I think it is important. I know that sounds kind of bad. They'll they'll say, why did you say that? I was like, oh. But if you've enjoyed and got something out of today's session, please show your support uh, by sharing this video, subscribing to our channel, liking it. And of course, I'd love for you to always make comments. Our next Norm Therapy session will be with Bobby on Sunday, uh, February 25th uh, at 6 p.m. 
please go to goarrow.org and normtherapy.com to explore our opportunities and seek help for yourself, someone in needing of, of our services and or some victim of abuse. If you're interested in applying to be, participate in our live stream, let us know by going to contact at normtherapy.com. And while you're there, if you're interested in becoming a norm therapist and, and come into our program, of becoming one. It's, it's not easy, but it's not so tough that you can't make it. We'll help you every step of the way. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again, Montez and for everyone to know, Montez and Bobby will be on the show together this Sunday. So you may want to get there. I'm not the referee. I'm just the guy asking some questions. I think they have grown tremendously with one another. And I'm I'm very happy that they both admitted that it was a lot to do with norm therapy. So I look forward to seeing you all on Sunday. It's a not it's a don't miss engagement with Bobby and her husband Montes. And I'll look forward to seeing you again, Montes. Okay. All right, man. You take care. Stay strong, brother. Well, yeah, okay. I am. Never know what's gonna happen around the corner. Built for it tough. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. All right, brother.